So I uh, took a chunk out of my finger while I was cooking dinner last night and uh, it hurt like hell. I probably should have gone to the hospital because it's a pretty big wound. Uh, but, you know, just like how I invest, I basically put a Band-Aid on it, told myself that everything was going to be okay, I'm not going to look at it, and uh, I hope that it resolves itself. How's it going? I'm Andrew with Investors Hub, and today we're going to be talking with Michael Klausner from Stanford University. And uh, while I was doing some research online, I, I stumbled across a paper that he co-authored where they had analyzed a bunch of SPACs that had merged over an 18-month period, uh, merged with their merging partners, not with each other, and uh, their performance. And I will link that uh, down in the description below. And yeah, so I reached out to him to see if I could get him to comment on how the SPAC industry is doing and his thoughts on it, and he replied. So we had that interview, and this is that. Please note that our videos are not designed to be direct investing advice. We're here to gather the perspective of different investors. Our channel and our content should just be one stop on the journey of trying to find out where to put your money. So the wisdom that I've been hearing anecdotally is that uh, you should never hold a SPAC through its merger. And uh, I was reading an article recently and I came across uh, your paper that you co-wrote and uh, share some of your findings with us. Sure. Well, one finding was that when we calculated how much cash a SPAC would contribute to a combined company once it merges with a target, it was far lower than one would expect. Uh, we've actually recently revised these numbers slightly from the published numbers and we'll replace the published numbers uh, or the published draft fairly soon. But what we found was that at the median, a SPAC would contribute $6.40 in cash to the combined company. The mean was far worse because there were some extremes. So what does that mean? That means that a shareholder has bought for $10, bought a share for $10, and or is giving up the opportunity to redeem for $10. And only $6.40 at the median is being contributed, being invested in that combined company. So that should give an investor pause. Second thing we found is that when a target negotiates with a SPAC for the terms of the merger, it has its eye on the cash. It, in effect, is selling a portion of its company, some of its shares, for the cash that it's going to receive. It is not crediting the SPAC merger with all that much surplus above that cash. So for example, what we found when we looked during our sample period, which is what I would call the pre-bubble period uh, through up until June or uh, through June 2020. If a SPAC had $7 of cash before the merger, a week after the merger, six months after the merger, with two separate statistical analyses, the share price of the post-merger SPAC went down to $7. So that was fairly startling. I mean, what that tells us, and it's consistent with the historical performance of SPAC shares is that the SPAC shareholders are bearing the cost of this dilution that's built into the SPAC structure. With respect to your question or the, the, the wisdom you've heard, uh, never hold a SPAC through a merger. I, I would say that if you've got a choice or if an investor has a choice of holding a SPAC or holding a portfolio of SPACs through a merger or holding none of them through a merger, I would go with a none of them through a merger. That's not to say that some will not do well, but on average uh, over the last decade, they've done poorly. Over the uh, year and a half that I studied beginning in uh, January 2019 through June 2020, uh, on average, they did poorly, um, but some have done well. Uh, so I guess the question is, would an investor want to try to choose what SPAC will do well and which ones will do poorly, knowing that on average they do poorly? Or would we rather pick a different investment to begin with doesn't, that doesn't have the baggage of a SPAC? So do you think that uh, investors are wising up to poor post-merger performance and so they're not really speculating on SPACs quite as much? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, Pre-merger and post-merger share prices have gone, come down somewhat in recent weeks. Um, but the last I checked, they were well above $10, uh, which is the redemption price. And um, you know, last fall, for instance, for instance, that wasn't the case. Uh, so I think relative to the past, uh, there still is a little bit of excess enthusiasm about SPACs. So what qualities do you look for in a, uh, a high quality SPAC? What we found is that when a SPAC invests in a merger, you know, contributes its cash to a uh, target company to create a 
better financed uh, combined company, that it contributes far less than the $10 a shareholder has paid. And that's not surprising. We all know that the sponsors take out a large chunk um, at the outset. And in addition, there are warrants issued to the uh, IPO shareholders, essentially for free. And that further dilutes the cash per share that will be invested. So that's the baggage of a SPAC. Uh, you could think of it as, as dilution, though there's some ex cash expenses as well that are perhaps a detail we don't need to go into. But that dilution is a big problem for a SPAC. So what qualities would I look for uh, in a SPAC if I'm going to think about investing in it? I would look at which SPAC has less dilution. How would I do that? A, I would look at, as of the time of the merger, uh, post-negotiation, uh, when the shareholders have a proxy statement in front of them, uh, I would look at how much of the so-called promote, the initial 20% that the, uh, that the sponsor received, uh, is still there. How much the sponsor has given up, and they do give up some uh, in negotiated merger, and how much did they keep? So how much does the sponsor have in the deal? And then second, how much of the deal, how, I'm sorry, how much of that amount that the sponsor has uh, is subject to an earnout? Uh, it is not uncommon that a sponsor will take a portion of its promote and say, I won't take any of it unless the post-merger price reaches X dollars per share, or often there are milestones. At X dollars per share, I'll get some of my promote. At Y dollars per share, I'll get more of my promote, et cetera. Now, typically, they still get a big, big portion of their promote, regardless of what happens to share price. Uh, but what I would look for would be low promote and promote subject to very ambitious uh, milestones. I would also look at how many warrants are outstanding. Those warrants are going to dilute returns to shareholders. Some SPACs have more, some SPACs have less. Um, uh, and then finally, I would say no matter what the result of this calculation is, and I'll tell you that will take some time. This is a calculation we did in our research for all SPACs for a year and a half. After you've done that research, you'll still find a hole. It's going to be a small hole or a big hole. You put in $10, maybe $8.50, maybe $6.50 will be uh, contributed to the combined company. I would ask yourself, will this sponsor remain involved? And is the sponsor skilled enough and have the ex sufficient experience to fill up that hole with value? That's what I would do. So where do you recommend that people start looking in order to properly do their due diligence whenever they're researching the SPAC that they're interested in? I would, I would start with what I just said. I would, I would spend some hours analyzing the, the cash in the SPAC. How much of your money is going to be invested in this combined company? And you put in $10. These days, if you bought on the market, you put in more than $10 much of the time. Uh, if you discover that only $3 is going to be put into the combined company, you probably ought to think twice. You discover $9.50 will, will be, maybe you think the sponsor can make up that difference. I think this is the key. Um, now, people spend a lot of time talking about how cool a company is that a SPAC is gonna merge with. It's a Tesla-like company, or it's gonna take tourists to the moon or, or, or whatever. Um, but an investment on bad terms in a good company is a bad investment. Uh, it really doesn't matter how good the company is if you're gonna get a small fraction of it uh, and a small amount of your cash is going to be put into it. So I would spend less time on the company, more time on the dilution. So we learned recently that the SEC is stepping up their scrutiny of SPACs and uh, their disclosure requirements. Does this align with some concerns that you've had in the past? And do you think that the SEC is moving in a direction that uh, is appropriate? Uh, yes and yes. Um, I think this is a very good move. Um, John Coates, uh, the acting director of corporate finance at the SEC, issued a statement that, that essentially expressed two concerns. One is the quality of the disclosures, which I think primarily focus on the question of cash per share or dilution that I spoke about earlier. The second is a point I haven't yet touched on, and that is the use of projections in SPAC mergers, or sometimes the term DSPAC is used. Um, I have to step back for a moment and give you a little legal background. When a company merges, it is common that it will provide, or the two companies that are merging will provide projections going out a few years for future revenues, profits, whatever. And that's fairly uncontroversial. In fact, it's considered a positive thing. In the mid nineties, in the Private Securities Litigation Reform Act or PSLRA, Congress explicitly protected these statements in the context of mergers and other transactions and in ordinary annual quarterly reports 
um, by providing a safe harbor against liability. So long as a issuer doesn't know that a projection or other forward-looking statement is incorrect, that safe harbor will apply and prevent a private plaintiff from winning a case against that issuer for a misstatement or an omission. Now that safe harbor, which as I said, was, was considered a positive thing and very important, is not available in IPOs. So you never see a projection in an IPO. You essentially never see it. Now, let's get back to SPACs. SPACs functionally are an IPO. They are the time that a company, a private company, becomes a public company. But technically, they are not an IPO. Technically, they are a merger. And as a result, lawyers advising SPACs have said that they can take advantage of the safe harbor available for mergers, and SPACs routinely provide projections in connection with their mergers. In fact, this has been considered by proponents of SPACs and their advisors as an advantage of SPACs over IPOs. They can provide projections. OK, so now let's, let me tell you what the SEC said. The SEC said not so fast. Functionally, a SPACs merger is an IPO. And while they didn't rule, and as a, simply a statement from the acting director of corporate finance, they can't make this a legally binding ruling, they raised the possibility that they would issue regulations on this and potentially rule that SPAC mergers cannot include projections. They didn't say this was the rule yet. They just said this is a possibility. So this is very important. It is a shot across the bow of SPAC projections. It may by itself induce more conservatism in projections, or it may not. I don't think it's going to eliminate projections. If the SEC wants to eliminate projections, I believe they're going to have to issue a rule that says that SPAC mergers are not covered by the safe harbor. But this is a first step. It may turn out to be sufficient, or it may be the beginning of SEC rulemaking on SPAC's disclosures generally, or perhaps specifically their projections. That, this is a very important statement, and I think that's where we stand as of now. Any final thoughts? You know, I don't think so. I think, uh, I think the name of the game is the dilution in the SPAC, and that uh, your viewers should take a hard look at that. Thanks for watching. And uh, if you like the video, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, share it with your friends. However you share your uh, videos, email, text message, social media. And uh, yeah, I'll see you again soon.